What's accepted that this is the best introduction schema I'm going to put together and I should just roll with it. My Robert Evans, me. Uh, oh boy, that was rough. That didn't go well. Nope. Um, this is Behind the Bastards, a podcast about terrible people. Um, and today, uh, my guest is uh, a rap artist, yeah. uh, musician, uh, propaganda. What's up, y'all? Wes, Wes. <laughs> How you doing, man? Man, I'm honored to be here. You know, I'm toning down my fandom. This is dope, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Well, I've, I've, I've been listening, ever since you started following me on Twitter, yeah. I've listened to your music a number of times, uh, and I like it a lot, particularly Board of Education. I think that's probably my, my favorite one of yours that I've heard so far. Thanks, man. Um, and I thought you'd be a good uh, uh, a good guest for this episode, especially since you have some like family history yeah. with the subject we're talking about. Yep. Um, before we get into it, do you want to introduce yourself differently than I introduced you? I think it was great. Yeah. No, I, um, <laughs> yeah, hip-hop artist, uh, do a pod couple pods now um one's called hood politics which maybe we'll talk about that later but uh Mm -hmm. and um one with my wife uh called the red couch and i yeah i do rap and poetry for a living i'm la native two daughters and a cat now (laughs) (laughs) frustratingly (laughs) anyway oh uh, i love cats yeah yeah well you can have ours (laughs) 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 yeah yeah and do you want to should, should I call you for this episode? Should you want to go by propaganda or should I call you Jason? Uh, it, it's mostly it's been shortened to prop. That's what okay. been the consensus. Yeah. All I'll right. Kind of become we'll go prop. with that. Yeah. All right. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, the Black Panthers and specifically the bastards who killed the Black Panthers. Yes. Um, yeah. And that's going to involve a lot of talk about what the Black Panthers did, what they believed, mm-hmm. um, which I is one of, uh, a, a subject I find really fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was a frustrating episode to write in part because there's so much that I had to leave out just because, you know, I, this is an 11,000 word script. You can Sheesh. only you can only <laughs> get in so much. Um, this is going to be one. We have a number of episodes like this where like people will hit me up after. But why didn't you bring up this? Why didn't you bring up yeah. that? And it's like, yeah, th- that's one of the when you cover something as complex as the Panthers, you're you're going to leave stuff out just because we have about two hours, two and a half, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, you have some family history with yeah. this, and I, I thought it might be good to go into that first. Yeah, yeah. So m- my father was a member of the, you know, South LA, I guess it, they call it South LA now, but it was, we called mm-hmm. it South Central, um, chapter of the Black Panther Party uh, in the 60s, or at the end of the 60s, in 1968. My father was a Vietnam War vet. Essentially, as a matter of fact, when we said we were going to do this, I like, I called him to make sure I had my storyline right and facts straight. (laughs) I don't want to get up here and embarrass myself, you know. Um, But yeah, so he essentially landed from Vietnam back in Los Angeles and almost made a beeline to like 41st and Central and joined the the Black Panther Party. And... um, yeah, so he was a part of the sort of after school tutoring uh part program. He also um was like basically they all took turns as far as like the which I'm I'm we're going to get to but like the policing the streets. So he was just, yeah. you know, standing behind as like, you know, interactions with the police were there cuz you know, police brutality was such a big deal, so he was a part of that. Um he was at the UCLA event that got shot up. He was uh Yes, and he said he said it was the span of time he was at was by the time that like FBI got involved, so his office got bombed. You know, he was at shootings. Yeah, so and at that point, my grandmother was like, "Baby, you can't do this no more." So she uh, (laughs) she kind of pulled the card on him, but you know, but yeah, he he stayed involved and uh, yeah. So I've been hearing bits and pieces of those stories as he like unpacks his trauma. You know what I'm saying? Um, And I just grew up with that, with those stories in my life, you know, and paintings of African princesses and kings on our wall. I had no Disney in my house. We had, had a picture yeah. of Mark, Martin and Malcolm and Marcus Garvey, like lining our walls and Geronimo Pratt and just, wow. I had that in my house. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's fascinating perspective to have had and a fascinating like way to learn about this. Because, yeah. Like for me, like obviously it's like a, a white kid who grew up in, um, 
a pretty mixed suburb, but a suburb that didn't have a, a very a huge black population. Yeah. Um, I learned almost nothing about the Black Panthers. I mean, I guess mm. a lot of our listeners are kind of in that the yeah. boat where like there's about three things you know about them. Uh, obviously, they were a black civil rights organization. Uh-huh. They did that thing where they put their fists in the air, and some of them <laughs> carried guns. And there's pictures of them carrying yeah. guns. And I think when I got out of high school, that's about all I knew about the Black Panthers. Mm-hmm. Right? Like there wasn't really anything else. Um, I was aware of. I think I caught the name Huey P. Newton for the first time in the lyrics of some hip hop songs, like, yeah. and and didn't really know who he was. Yeah. Um. So for the longest time, I had no real understanding about the organization, and I think they kind of blended into the general wallpaper of the civil rights movement for yeah. me. Um. Mm-hmm. Until I started reading about them specifically, and I've come to the conclusion, and I say this a lot, um, that. It's like a, a an unforgivable failing of our education system that this isn't a bigger part of like standard American history. Man, uh, let textbooks. me tell you, absolutely. <laughs> and like, which I know you'll get into, but the importance I know my father did put on and the party put on of like knowing the Constitution, knowing yeah. the Bill of Rights. Like I felt like I was so well versed in American civics because my father was a panther you know what i'm saying yeah and which was funny because i was like i just didn't understand that i thought every house was like this because it was just this was normal for me so when you'd bring up i'm like well you know 14th amendment say yada 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 you know seventh graders and kids are like what you know it's just i just knew this because that's how that's what you learn as a panther like you need to know your rights man you know yeah yeah it's critical yeah 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 um, so, uh, we, we, yeah, I think we've, we've introduced this well enough. I'm yeah. going to start, uh, get into the episode at, uh, not the beginning, but I guess a beginning. Okay. Um, on February 17th, 1942, Huey P. Newton was born in Monroe, Louisiana, uh, the youngest child of Walter and Armelia, uh, Newton's seven children. His dad, Walter, was, uh, I would say, pretty badass guy. Uh, he worked two jobs his entire life. He served as the minister for the Bethel Baptist Church in Monroe on Sundays. And Walter was very infamous in his community for not taking any shit from white folks. Um, And there's a story about him getting into an argument with one of his employers, a young white guy, who yells at him that he whips colored men for arguing with him. And Walter shot back that nobody, basically nobody whips me unless they're a better man than me, unless they can beat me up. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And this guy, this guy backs down, (laughs) proving that he was not. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Basically, if you want to whip me, like you gotta, you gotta be able to kick yeah. my ass. Like yeah. you want to try that? Yeah, you better it's, win. It's, yeah. Now, in the 1940s in Louisiana, saying that sort of thing uh, could get you murdered as a black guy. Yeah. But Walter had a strange and somewhat unique ability um, to stand up to white folks in his community without being killed. And Huey later theorized that this is because his dad was mixed race. His father's father, uh, Huey's grandpa, was mm-hmm. a white man who had raped his mother. Um, and Walter's neighbors knew his white family and didn't want to shed part white blood. This was Huey's theory as to why mm. his dad was able to do this. Um, there, yeah. is, there is something to be said that, like, unless you're in, like, communities of color, just how colorism does, like, mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, police how we treat each other and how we see each yeah. other. So, yeah, someone that's a little more fair-skinned, we would say, like, they would say passing. Like, he passes as something else. So, like, there's a few things you can get away with, you know, um, and at least in the psyche of, you know, a person of color like myself who's not light-skinned. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in uh, 1945, when Huey was a toddler, the Newton family moved to Oakland, California. Um, now, Walter always managed to bring in a very stable income. Uh, the family was still very poor, but, like, they weren't ever sort of, like, starving or anything like that. Um, their most common meal was kush, which is, uh, I guess, a fried cornbread dish, which they often ate for every meal of the day. Um, Huey grew up watching his father work 80 hour weeks and still constantly be like stressed out over bills. Um, Mm. and this was like a really had a big impact on him growing up, this kind of constant economic anxiety. Mm. Um, he didn't have an easy adolescence. School was difficult for him and he seems to have had, I think we probably would would have today have diagnosed him with a learning disability because he was incredibly intelligent. He just, I think teachers had a difficulty reaching him Mm. is how I would, it seems like what was going on. By the time he was in 11th grade, he was still illiterate, and his teachers assumed that he was just not intelligent. Um, And this was obviously not the case, because Huey's hobby outside of school was memorizing poetry with his brother. Um, But it was not until his high school counselor told him that he was too dumb for college that Huey P. Newton decided he had to prove them all wrong. So for two straight years, he studied like a madman, teaching himself to read and write and eventually to graduate high school. 
Wow. Um, in 1959, he enrolled at Merritt College, where he joined the Afro-American Association and became well-known for his debate skills. Uh, all thought that Huey might not be college material fell out the window as he began a meteoric path of scholastic excellence, and he would eventually receive a PhD. Um, so yeah, this seems to me to be a clear yeah. case of a kid that maybe just had like, his teachers didn't know how to reach him, yeah. but like he was he was brilliant. Um, That's dope. Do you know it's funny? Because it's like, I, I, I thought about the my credibility I'm putting on danger here by you saying stuff that I didn't know. Do you know what I'm saying? And being like, oh, wow, I didn't, I didn't know that. You know, and it's kind of already started. I was like, I didn't, didn't know you couldn't read till you, till 11th grade. Cause I've only known him as, like you said, this yeah. orator, you know, that was able to articulate the feelings and the sentiment of black America in that time. That's crazy. Yeah. I didn't know that. Well, and it, I think one of the, one of the reasons it's important is that from a very early age, he gets this lesson that like, the system clearly failed him because yeah. it didn't know how to treat him properly. And he had to build a system for himself to elevate mm -hmm. himself. Um, and obviously, like, I didn't know any of this until I yeah. read a couple of weeks ago. I read a book, a really good book called Black Against Empire by Joshua Bloom and Waldo Martin. Um, that's, that's a really right fascinating there, yeah. history of the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it's, it's very readable. I would say compulsively readable. It's a really good history. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like one of the major sources of this episode. Okay. Um, it's very comprehensive and detailed. And I didn't know almost any of this stuff until mm -hmm. I read it. So, yeah, I, I hugely recommend that. Yeah. And I'm going to actually, I'm going to, I'm going to read a quote from it now discussing what set Huey P. Newton apart from his academic colleagues. Mm -hmm. Quote, he had a side that most of the budding intellectuals around him lacked. He knew the street. He could understand and relate to the plight of the swelling ranks of unemployed, the brothers on the block, in his words, who lived outside the law. Newton's street knowledge helped put him through college as he covered his bills through theft and fraud. But when Newton was caught, he used his book knowledge to study the law and defend himself in court, impressing the jury and defeating several misdemeanor charges. So, so good. I mean, I'm... I'm on board with this guy. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's that dual consciousness that W. Yeah. Du Bois talk about. Like you just, you, your street knowledge and your book knowledge is like, if you got them both rock, rocking, you, you, you're mm -hmm. unfadeable. Well, it's this thing that you brought yeah. up earlier where like it's so important. And yeah. this is like something the Panthers always emphasize to under, have an understanding of the law and your yeah. rights. Yeah. 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 In uh, 1962, yeah, Huey, oh, sorry. No, no, no. No, oh, I was going to say, yeah, I, I, I firmly believe this, like, and, and, uh, and like I said, like, we, we, we built an entire show around it that, like, especially when it comes to, like, politics, specifically geopolitics, like, I have this, under, like, my belief is, like, if you came from any sort of, like, neighborhood environment, I don't care if it's, like, rural Oklahoma or, you know, inner city Detroit, if you come from a city and you had to navigate, you know, tribes in a city you understand geopolitics you just don't yeah. you just ain't got the language for it you know what i'm saying so so being able to use your own what we would call like hood antennas to figure out what's happening in you know dominant culture world like if you have a grasp on both of those dude you're un, you're undefeatable yeah that that does make me like I think maybe one of the major issues we have diplomatically and like the international stage is that number one, so many of our diplomats are guys who like donated money, rich kids who donated <laughs> right? money to get the yeah. job. But like also nobody who I I do feel like somebody with that sort of street experience would do a yeah. better job, for example, of doing diplomacy in a place like Baghdad, because you just have a deeper understanding of like yeah. um, kind of the interpersonal relationships necessary to make Dude, if you progress had to, there. You had to convince a bully to not give you a swirly. If, yeah. you, if you had to, if you went through that, you know how to come to a, 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 a negotiation table. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> especially, especially like if you're Baghdad, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And the bully is, you know, the G6, you know what I'm saying? Or, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Bullies America. It's like, well, I know how to deal with bullies. So here, here's, Here's how I think we can handle this. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Now, um, in 1962, Huey P. Newton met a, a guy named Bobby Seale at a protest opposing the U.S. blockade of Cuba. Um, now, Bobby had been born in 1936, about five years before Huey. And while Huey was the youngest of seven, Bobby was the oldest child of three. He'd grown up in Oakland, where both his mother and father worked. Uh, Bobby's dad was profoundly abusive. Uh, and Bobby grew up kind of accepting that random violence from authority was a regular fact of life, which, again, would have, you know, uh, be obviously influential in his worldview yeah. as he grew up. 
Now, obviously, when people go through that, there's a number of different ways they react to it. And I think Bobby sort of dealt with it in the healthiest way you can um, mm-hmm. and became sort of obsessed with fighting bullies wherever he found them. Yeah. Um, at one point when he was a little kid, he saw another child shove his sister out of a swing. Bobby pushed that kid out of the swing and declared that now everyone had on the playground had a right to use the swing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Justice. <laughs> yeah. So Bobby joined the Air Force as a young man, both to get out of the house and so he could learn how to use firearms. Um, He was given a dishonorable discharge three years in when he hunted down a man who stole from him and beat that guy very badly with a pipe. Um, You can read the story in Bobby's biography, Seize the Time, the story of the Black Panther Party, which is available for free online. I'll have a link to it. Um, Personally, I think the dude that he attacked had it coming. Mm -hmm. Um, Bobby bounced around for a long time after this, uh, getting whatever jobs he could for a few months at a time before they found out about his dishonorable discharge. By 1962, he was down and out in California, and he took the refuge taken by all such men in that situation. He became a stand-up comedian. Sheesh. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know this about his backstory. Yeah. Don't judge me. He later wrote... (laughs) <laughs> he later wrote this that year i worked as a comedian in two or three clubs around oakland and at private parties i think comedians know a hell of a lot they know a lot of things that are oppressive and wrong um yes yeah yeah i like that <laughs> that attitude <laughs> huey and bobby seal met at that protest against the blockade of cuba uh, and they were both members of the afro-american association together uh, the leader of that group donald warden was a confusing man who really liked castro but was also a major believer in the power of black capitalism to fix societal injustice yeah um he was a bitter critic of mainstream civil rights organizations Huey P. Newton was initially enthralled by Donald's ideology, but he grew frustrated when, over the course of months, it became clear that that, this, like, talk was basically all that he felt Donald was good for. Mm. Um, He also grew critical of Donald's focus on black capitalism, which he didn't think would do a very good job of liberating black people from the hole that he felt capitalism had dug for them. And again, Huey's this guy growing up with all this economic anxiety. He's he's not a pro-capitalism dude. I mean, we're still debating this. Yeah. You know, in communities, Yeah. yeah. And um, during this episode, I think we're we're going to discuss uh, at length a group of people who were distinctly on the fringes of the civil rights movement and often very critical of the men and women in like kind of the mainstream civil rights movement who worked to alleviate American racism through more traditional legal Mm -hmm. means. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like we should pause right now to talk a little bit about what legally and acceptably working towards equality looked like in this period, because I think we get a sanitized, at least I think as a white kid, I got a very sanitized version of the civil rights movement. Yeah, you got Um, nice. You got nice MLK. Yeah, well, you ain't get anti-war not, MLK. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and socialist MLK. Yeah, socialist and had MLK. Guns in his yeah. couch, MLK. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but even uh, more to the point for what we're going to talk about now, what I think I got a sanitized version of more than anything was a sanitized version of how white people reacted to MLK. Yeah, um, and how people like LBJ reacted mm-hmm. to MLK. Yeah. and so we're going to talk a little about. Now that now. Yeah. So then as now, uh, most black people in America voted Democrat. Um, but this should not lead people to believe that the Democratic Party at the time embraced black people as like equal comrades. Um, they were just moderately less racist than the Republicans and mm-hmm. not always moderately less racist than the Republicans. Some state Democratic parties, including the one in Mississippi, banned black people from membership. Mm-hmm. Uh, members of that state's Democratic Party regularly beat and even murdered black people who tried to register to vote. So black Mississippians developed their own party, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which focused on registering black people to vote. Three of the party's activists were kidnapped, tortured, and murdered in 1964, which is the year that the Civil Rights Act gets signed into law by President Johnson. Mm-hmm. Um, so Johnson at the time was, again, you know, the man who signs the Civil Rights Act into law, um, played a what I would describe as a profoundly cynical and gross game of political brinksmanship uh, with the Mississippi uh, Freedom Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. And he kind of yielded to the civil rights movement in a couple of areas, but also tried to maintain the Democratic Party's southern dominance by throwing bones to the racists in the Democratic Party. Yeah. And in doing so, he was engaging in like a, a proud tradition that goes back to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, because during the Great Depression, FDR successfully won the black vote for the first time for did the Democratic Party yeah. by involving black people in the New Deal and giving them access to social programs and even appointing several black men as advisors. But he kept Southern racist Democrats on board by refusing to take any action against segregation. Mm-hmm. Um, so LBJ was kind of engaging in what at that point was a decades old tradition within the Democratic Party. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and again, these are 
still the conversations we're having, you know, to this mm -hmm. day, like, uh, we get, I'm getting my thought here. Like, yeah, there's the idea of like, um, I know you're only helping me because it's expedient for you, right? And then you have, which you'll see in the in the Black Panther Party too, like these two 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 sides of this coin of like the like like yeah like the Marcus Garveys of the world that are like they're never gonna treat us fairly. We will never mm -hmm. get a shake here. It's never gonna work. Let's just leave, right? And then you have the other side that says like no, like my grandparents my ancestors like built the built the damn nation like you know what i'm saying that's our blood in this soil like we we picked this you know why you a superpower because you ain't pay the workers you know what i'm saying so like <laughs> yeah. that's why you a superpower so so it's like nah i'm just as much american as you are you gonna include me in your documents you know what i'm saying so like that that two sides and then and then and then you're and then it's like i remember the the pain and hurt in my eye in my my parents, my father and my grandmother's eyes when I got so disillusioned early on that I was just like, man, it's like, hey, you going to go vote today? And I was like, man, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I'm not even sitting in this traffic, man. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I don't even, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? And just like how hard they fought just for me to have the right to do it. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. made me be like, dog, I can't. But yeah, just that, that like, just the, how hard they fought for me to be able to do that, you know, it really gave me pause. But it's still, yeah, that same frustration where it's just like, I just, it's, these people don't love us. And we just will never know unless it's like expedient for them, you know, that if you pass a civil rights law, it's like, I don't, I don't know if you really like me though, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, that's, that's, um, that's kind of where LBJ finds himself in this yeah. mission. He's a guy who's racist and he's willing to kowtow to racists. Yeah. He's also not so racist that he's unwilling to push for progress when he thinks it advantages him electorally. A pragmatic he's not, racist. Exactly. A pragmatic yeah. racist. Yes. That's a fair way to refer to <laughs> yes. Lyndon Baines Johnson. Yes. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a quote from Black Against Empire again, kind of describing how this all comes to a head at the Democratic Party State Convention in Jackson, Mississippi in 1964. Quote, the MFDP held a state convention in Jackson in early August and selected 68 delegates to attend the upcoming Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey. President Johnson was determined to maintain white Southern support and work to undermine the MFDP. On August 12th, Mississippi's Democratic governor, Paul B. Johnson, told the all-white Dixiecrat delegation that President Johnson had personally promised him not to seat the MFDP. The president refused to discuss the MFDP with civil rights leaders and instructed FBI Director Hoover to monitor the renegade party closely and provide regular updates on its activities to the White House. This is not going to be the last time we hear about the oh FBI in God. this story. Yeah. <laughs> Sheesh. So, yeah, basically the MFDP's goal was to try and make enough noise at this assembly mm -hmm. um, that the Credentials Committee would have to call a vote about whether to seat uh, the delegation from the MFDP at the convention that year. And they called a number of people to testify before the committee, including a woman named Fanny Lou Hamer, uh, who was a, a black activist with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, now, she was fired from her job and beaten in jail by black prisoners who were being ordered by, from, uh, probably under the threat of death, from white policemen to attack. Her. Yeah. Um, so basically, she gets thrown in jail for registering people to vote, and the cops tell other people who are in prison or who are in jail with her, like, beat the shit out of this lady or we'll deal with you. And this is what uh, Fannie Lou Hamer says uh, at the Jackson uh, convention. Quote, the first Negro began to beat, and I was beat until I was exhausted. After the first Negro was exhausted, the state highway patrolman ordered the second Negro to take the blackjack. The second Sheesh. Negro began to beat. I began to scream, and one white man got up and began to beat me on my head and tell me to hush. One my, uh, white man, my dress had worked up high. He walked over and pulled my dress down, and he pulled my dress back up. All of this on account we wanted to register, to become first-class citizens. Mm. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. <sighs> Ay, ay, ay. It's just this onion of pain just every mm -hmm. time. And the more you dig, you're just like, oh, yep. Yeah, that yeah. happened. Yeah. You know what's not an onion of pain? Oh, jeez. The, uh, <laughs> the <laughs> most likely the other pod that's about to be advertised. Yeah. I'm just yeah. saying, if I'm, if I'm running y'all's random things, usually it's another pod. Yeah. Or the Koch brothers. Or let's hope it's uh, an oil refining. Maybe it's an oil uh, refiner. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, here it is. 
<laughs> <That's> ridiculous. <laughs> There's not going to be a single good ad transition. I, I love it, man. <laughs> We're back. So we just talked about um, we just talked about Fanny Hamer uh, and her her speech at the Mississippi Democratic Conference, um, and it caused enough of an uproar and it gained enough national sympathy because it was televised mm-hmm. that LBJ couldn't just completely ignore the MFDP. So she gets up and kind of pulls at people's human heartstrings, like even people. Most people are pretty racist back then, yeah. but they're not inhuman, and something like that makes them feel terrible and yeah. so they're like yeah maybe we should seat this delegation which lbj feels he can't do because uh again he's trying to kowtow to the racist contingent to the democratic party yeah. so he's put in this situation where he has to deal with them but he also is not willing to actually deal with them so instead he brings in his vice president history's greatest monster hubert humphrey mm. um and hubert uh hubert's job is to deal with this problem which is again the problem is black people wanting to vote without <laughs> being murdered yeah <laughs> The problem is the Constitution. Anyway, go on. The problem is the Constitution. Yeah. Uh, that, that pesky document. Damn yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Humphrey meets with the MFDP delegation, and he tells them that they're not going to be seated, but that the president is willing to compromise by letting what he called educated professionals from the group, one of whom was white, sit with the Mississippi delegation (laughs) at the convention. Humphrey refused to let Miss Hamer sit with the delegation, saying the president will not allow that illiterate woman to speak from the floor of the convention. So that's, yeah. 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 Now, the MFDP, to their credit, refuses to compromise, but that wound up not mattering because this was all a scheme in the first place. While they were meeting with Humphrey, LBJ had the party announce that the MFDP had reached a compromise with the Democratic Party. The whole thing had been double crossed, so he'd put them in that meeting so they wouldn't know that this was going on. And then yeah. by the time it was announced, they have to either spoil the whole convention and the election, which obviously matters to them because civil yeah. rights is on the docket. Yeah. Or, like, just let him get away with this shit. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, LBJ kind of wins this round. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it sucks. Um, but what happened there, like, the double cross in 1964 was really widespread knowledge, particularly in the black community. And mm-hmm. it infuriated many people who felt the civil rights movement had mainly achieved cosmetic victories. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm X addressed these people when he said... Quote, now you're facing a situation where the young Negroes coming up, they don't want to hear that turn the other cheek stuff. No, there's a new deal coming. There's new thinking coming in. There's new strategy coming in. It'll be Molotov cocktails this month, hand grenades next month, and something else next month. It'll be ballots or it'll be bullets. It'll be liberty or it will be death. The only difference about this kind of death, it'll be reciprocal. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Very famous speech. Very famous quote. Yeah. That ballot and bullet speech, man. Yeah. Yeah resonates too deep yeah it resonates and if we're you know there it it, like obviously the story of um the 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 white sort of people generally referred to as the the founding fathers yeah almost all of them um were deeply racist yeah but there is still there is this one thing that's really interesting to me there is this similarity in sort of the the language um, anyone fighting for what they perceive as liberty tends to use because yes. Malcolm X's Ballad of the Bullet speech, very similar to Nathan Hale's Liberty or Death speech, yes. Um, yes. which is really fascinating to me. Yeah. yeah. That's a good catch, man. You're yeah. really astute young man. <laughs> <laughs> So February 6th, 1965, we're going back to Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton now. I just wanted to give that sort of context of Mm -hmm. what kind of how frustrating and futile it would have felt to try to do this legally and respectably by kind of the, the mainstream attitudes. So February 6th, 1965, was a very key day for Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton. Uh, That is the day that Malcolm X was assassinated by a member of the Nation of Islam. Um, This made Bobby so angry that he grabbed a bunch of bricks from his mother's garden, broke them in half, and started tossing them at the cars of any white people who drove by. He vowed to make himself into a motherfucking Malcolm X. Uh, Millions of black folks across the country were incensed by Malcolm X's death. And six months after his assassination, the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles was host to something that looks very close to a civil war. The Watts yeah. riots. Yeah. Um, and I think riot might even be an unfair term. Like legally, that's what they were declared. Yeah. Um, it was an uprising. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And the most direct cause of this was the mass murder of black people by the LAPD. Uh, 65 black men had been murdered by Los Angeles cops from January of 1962 to July of 1965. Um, In 27 cases, the victim was shot in the back. Uh, Only one of these murders was actually ruled an unjust homicide, though. Uh, And this was a case where two cops were literally playing cops and robbers with real guns and accidentally murdered a newspaperman. Sheesh. Um, Yeah. So... So, no, no, no. I was going to say, I, I, it's crazy. Like, today's just one of those heavy days. I just left my my great aunt's house, like my grandma's sister. And mm. she was just now, right before I got here, talking about the Watts riots. And so it was like stuff that she's never said. Well, because I never really asked. But, like, you know, my, my family's been in Los Angeles since the 50s. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, when she was describing the moment of the riots, she started dropping these mm-hmm. other gems like, hey, you know, when Jim Crow, because my family's originally from Texas, then they moved here. Um, said the, that LAPD was like recruiting from like disgruntled, like Southern, once Jim Crow ended, like they were recruiting these like disgruntled Southern men that were like frustrated about Jim Crow and wanted to do something about America. So they were coming to be a part of law enforcement. So if you feel... Yep. Compton, Watts, L.A. with these men who are mad that Jim Crow's over to powder keg. You, you're, yeah. It's going to explode. Yeah. It's going to explode. Mm-hmm. Um, and it does um, in, in during the Watts riots. Yeah. And the, the, the most direct cause of the riot itself, the uprising itself, uh, was the traffic stop of Marquette and Ronald Fry. Mm-hmm. Um, both men were pulled over by a highway patrol cop uh, and a crowd gathered while they argued with him. Um, the crowd got very angry when the police started beating Rena Fry, their mother, with a blackjack when she Sheesh. came in to intervene. So they started beating this this middle-aged woman mm-hmm. with, you know, a blackjack's basically, it's like a big leather beat stick, mm-hmm. I guess is the best way to describe it. Mm-hmm. Um uh, yeah, so the Watts riots deserve an episode of their own. Um, for yeah. now, what's worth noting is that large numbers of, the police would call them rioters, I would prefer to call them protesters, uh, yeah. fired on police helicopters with rifles. Um, huge numbers of guns were stolen. The police chief compared the violence to Vietnam, and so did black activists on the street who were interviewed yeah. by journalists at the time. 34 people, most of whom were black, were killed in the violence, and mostly by police. Yeah. Now, all of this, the failures of conventional politics to provide an effective remedy to racism, the death of Malcolm X and the Watts riot, all of this helped spur uh, a massive surge in revolutionary black activism in the United States in the mid-1960s. Um, now, Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale were already very politically radical um, when this happened, and they'd flirted over the years with a, a series of different groups, including one called the Revolutionary Action Movement. Um, Ram argued that black people were a colony, um, had basically been colonized by American white people, mm-hmm. and that the struggle for black liberation was part of the global struggle against colonialism, which was then happening. You know, yeah. we're in the post-World War II period. All these different colonies around the world are starting yeah. to either fight for their freedom or protest for it. Um And Huey's brother Melvin joined RAM, Uh, but Huey was kind of frustrated by the fact that he felt the organization preferred posturing and intellectual discussion to direct action. He became convinced that none of these ideological organizations could reach black people on the street who didn't have like a thorough grounding in political theory. Mm. Basically, like what you're talking about, I agree with, but all you're doing is talking and you're talking about theory that's at such an intellectual level that you're not able to reach people who are just like, you know, living and, and working sort yeah. of at a, a street level that aren't academics. Yeah. Um, and Bobby Seale actually joined Ram for a while, but he developed basically the same frustrations that Huey did with them. And mm-hmm. he wrote about it in his autobiography, quote, I got very frustrated with those cats. I didn't think they were going to do anything, and I became very discouraged about being able to work with them. They had a lot of paranoid hang-ups, and they began to accuse me of things. They had so many bullcrap suspicions, I couldn't deal with them, and I broke loose from those cats. I got mad at them one night and busted down their door. All of them hid behind their damn beds. At that point, I couldn't deal with them anymore because they wouldn't defend themselves, even against one little old me. There were four or five of them in the pad, but they ran hiding. I just didn't respect them anymore. I was thinking to myself, later for these dudes, I'm going to find myself a righteous person partner to righteously run with see <laughs> this is terrible but i as right as that is and as serious as this moment is i only hear that in like my dad's friends voices <laughs> just like, man i was looking for some righteous dudes you know yeah man these cats they wasn't even about the revolution you know what i'm saying like this is like my dad would say it he's like man i just need to look for some dudes i can run with be real bad I'm like all right yeah my dad still yeah, talks did. like that catch on the 53rd <laughs> 
Like, what does that mean, Pop? Don't be selling me no. Put that on the plate and split it, Jack. I'm like, I don't. What? What? What does that mean, Dad? Anyway. The whole um his whole autobiography is written that way and it's part yeah. of why I really enjoy it because it's not something I had much exposure to. Um and I, I enjoy that sort of like the language he uses. Yeah. I, I like it a lot. Yeah. Yeah, he's there's an a, a righteous dude. Almost poetic cadence to it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh so the partner uh, that Bobby Seale wound up finding uh, was Huey P. Newton. Uh, now, the two had known each other for a while, and they'd always gotten along, but they drifted politically in slightly different activist circles. Um, but now, after the Watts riots, they decided to create a new organization together, the Soul Students Advisory Council. And they weren't the only people who created it, but they were two of the founding members. Yeah. Um, now, they organized protests against the draft for black students because um, they felt that, like, without sort of being treated equally, they shouldn't be expected to to fight for the country mm. like, without consenting to in the same way. Yeah. And they also worked to have black studies courses added to Merritt College curriculum. Mm. And in this last one, they were successful. Huey suggested the group should next get involved in fighting police brutality. But before this project could really get off the ground, Huey and Bobby wound up running straight into some police brutality of their own. On Thursday, March 17th, 1966, at around 9 p.m., Bobby and Huey and their friend Weasel were hanging out in Berkeley, walking to the University of California campus. Bobby was reciting an anti-war poem he liked, Uncle Sammy Call Me Full of Lucifer. They drew a small crowd to themselves who urged Bobby to recite it more loudly, and a police officer arrived right as Bobby sang out these lines. You school my naive heart to sing red, white, and blue stars and stripes songs. You school my naive heart to sing red, white, and blue stars and stripes songs and to pledge eternal allegiance to all things blue, true, blue-eyed, blonde, blonde-haired, white chalk, white skin with USA tattooed all over. And the officer, uh, an off-duty cop named George Williamson, tried to arrest Bobby um, for this. Uh, he, his justification was that Bobby had been blocking the street. This caused a fist fight, which brought in more cops, which led to both Bobby and Huey being arrested. So from poetry, y'all. Yeah. So all right, artists, <laughs> write write them poems. <laughs> it's it's interesting. Yeah. Like that, it says a lot. Yeah, about the power of poetry. That yeah. like this scares a cop enough that he has to on his off hours. Yeah, feels right. Like he has to get involved. Well, you, to stop you're this. Breaking the law. Uh, yeah. Well, poetry. God. <laughs> God darn it. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so next, according to the book Black Against Empire, quote. A few weeks later, Newton and Seal saw a policeman pushing around a black man for no apparent reason. Mm. The officer arrested the man and took him to the station. Following Mark Comfort's example, Newton and Seal went to the station and bailed the man out using money from their organization's treasury. The brothers started to cry, and it touched Bobby deeply. Bobby was fed up with armchair intellectualizing and wanted to stand up against the police, recalling, I was filled with a staunch belief of the need for brotherhood and revolution and rebellion against the racist system. Yeah. So... It was Huey who first suggested that the SSAC members should arm themselves with rifles and shotguns and host an armed rally for Malcolm X's birthday. The guns were explicitly to honor Malcolm X's call for black people to engage in armed self-defense. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, Bobby Seale would write in his autobiography, quote, Huey was running down that the law says every man has the right to arm himself by the Second Amendment of the Jivas Constitution of the United States. <laughs> he says that we are going to exhaust that because in the end, the man will say we don't have a Second Amendment of the Constitution. Constitution. So Huey's saying that, like, we should arm ourselves in protest because we have the right to do that. Mm. But also, they're going to strip us of our right to carry guns once Yo. we start doing it. <laughs> His, history be rhyming, dog. Like, I mean, it was, and it's that brilliant, like, um, and I know the word is so, it's such a pregnant word, but just like the co-opting of language that you use. Same thing Frederick Douglass did with his, like, Fourth of yep. July speech of, like, Hey, homie, you said you built this thing for liberty and freedom. And I, I, this ain't my celebration. I don't know what you're talking about. You know what I'm saying? And he was like, these are your words. You said mm -hmm. I filmed this. I, I started this nation because of this. And he's like, well, OK, that's, those are your words. You said all men were created equal. That's what you yeah. said. You know what I'm saying? And then right here, you said every man has a right to bear arms. That's what you said. Am I, I mean, what am I, a Martian? Like, I have a right yeah. to bear arms. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Huey uh, thought that the presence of firearms would also help to draw in uh, the people he called the brothers on the block mm -hmm. um, more than, you know, waving protest signs and placards because a lot of those guys were involved with, like, different, like, gangs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they understood guns and, you know, mm -hmm. they weren't 
political theorizers. And he was like, this is something that I think I can get him on board with. Mm-hmm. Um, the other members of the SSAC thought this was too risky. Uh, Bobby Seale was the only person who backed Huey's plan. Um, so he and Huey quit the SSAC and formed a new organization, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, in October of 1966. And during his studies, Huey had done research into the state of California's laws, and he'd learned that it was actually legal for Californians to openly carry firearms in public, even loaded ones, Mm -hmm. provided those weapons were not pointed at anyone in a threatening manner. And it's interesting, when you read modern stories about this by like mainstream news sources like the Chicago Tribune, they'll always say it was a loophole in the law. (laughs) It's not a loophole, it was just legal. It was the law. (laughs) It was just the law that you could do this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. (laughs) He didn't find a loophole. Yeah. This is the law. That's what yeah. it says. Or was the law. <laughs> this is me putting my hands up as if I'm holding an actual paper that's the law. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, uh, this was not entirely Huey's idea. He'd also read about the actions of a group called the Community Alert Patrol, or CAP, over in the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles. After the uprising, CAP had been formed to watch police in black neighborhoods. And CAP's efforts were incredibly important, but their activists were often victimized and abused by the LAPD. And some of them had started talking about carrying guns during their patrols. So as the Black Panthers came together, Huey's plan evolved. He decided that the Panthers would organize armed patrols to follow police officers around and observe them during traffic stops. Mm -hmm. The new Black Panthers started doing just this. In February of 1967, a group of them, including Newton and Seal, were stopped in a car loaded down with rifles and handguns. And I'm going to quote now from a great article in The Atlantic titled The Secret History of Guns. Quote, When one officer asked to see the guns, Newton refused. I don't have to give you anything but my identification, name, and address, he insisted. This, too, he had learned in law school. Who the hell do you think you are? An officer responded. Who in the hell do you think you are? Newton replied indignantly. He told the officer that he and his friends had a legal right to have their firearms. Newton got out of the car, still holding his rifle. What are you going to do with that gun? Asked one of the stunned policemen. What are you going to do with your gun? Newton replied. (laughs) By this time, the scene had drawn a crowd of onlookers. An officer told the bystanders to move on, but Newton shouted at them to stay. California law, he yelled, gave civilians a right to observe a police officer making an arrest so long as they didn't interfere. Newton played it up for the crowd. In a loud voice, he told the police officers, if you try to shoot at me or if you try to take this gun, I'm going to shoot back at you, swine. Mm. Which is the fucking balls on him. This, that, <laughs> y'all wonder why that man on everybody's t-shirts. Why, yeah. why our rappers talk about him all the time. God damn. Right? Because it's mm. like, I mean, like straight up. I mean, it's it's. I love that you're painting the picture of like the totality of the cultural moment. A lot of times we see history as like these like single file line events that aren't like interact like you're all living the same moment just like mm-hmm. now you know what i'm saying so we put all those moments together like nothing i mean i grew up in i'm in, i'm la in the 80s and 90s i'm like you don't talk to police like that you know what i'm saying like no. right you feel me like we just don't do i was in the well, gang I mean, sweep you know the street sweepers the gang injunctions like you don't, you don't talk to police like that you know so just seeing that type of like these are my rights homie like it's just amazing i mean I'm a tall white guy, so I have a certain degree of police shield, and yeah. I would be terrified of talking right? to the police like that. <laughs> like, Crazy, homie. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Whew. <laughs> Whew. So fucking incredibly, Huey, Bobby, and their comrades were allowed to continue on without arrest because they, they hadn't broken the law. Nope. Um, the whole event <laughs> left everyone in the car and all of the onlookers who'd gathered to watch the altercation stunned, uh, as we're stunned yeah. just talking about it today. Um, it's it's just hard to imagine, even in 2020, this happening yeah. without bloodshed. Um yeah. Yeah, so the whole event made Bobby Seale decide that Huey P. Newton was, in his words, the baddest motherfucker in the world. Uh, It convinced Huey of something important, too. The gun is where it's at and about and in. Yeah. Yeah. So So uh, this spreads through the community like wildfire, and young men begin joining the Black Panthers in droves. Uh, Their armed patrols of the police become a regular thing. Um, And, you know, they have a lot of strict rules about this. You're never supposed to be closer than 10 feet to the officer or the person being stopped. You have law books on you at the time. You're quoting directly from them. Like, they're not just, like, like there to intimidate the police. They are there to give information on rights to the person being stopped. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, and so, yeah, whenever a, a, a black person was stopped by the police, observing Panthers would both be an armed presence there and would be providing legal advice. 
Um, and as their notoriety spread, so too did the Black Panthers um, all across the country. Um, and firearms were a central facet of their identity from the beginning. Yeah. New recruits were taught the gun is the only thing that will free us. The group purchased rifles by selling copies of Mao Zedong's Little Red Book to students in Berkeley. Over the years, their arsenal grew to include machine guns, as well as tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition. New recruits received training on black nationalism, socialism, and how to clean and handle and use firearms. It's also worth noting during this period that we talk in, in my audiobook, The War on Everyone, mm -hmm. uh, we talk a bit about how KKK groups, white supremacist groups are easily able to buy and smuggle machine guns and other military grade weaponry from the, the army, from like racists in the army at this yeah. point. And the Black Panthers do the same thing from black people in the army. Yeah. Like they're getting machine guns and weaponry directly from Yo, the military. <laughs> I, probably shouldn't share, I probably shouldn't share this, but I'm going to to all trillion of your followers. <laughs> but like, I just found this out on Thanksgiving that like my Uncle Charles was like doing that. Like he was <laughs> like, he was like selling. First of all, he was like, he said he was selling like, he was selling like engine parts in like Munich when he was in Germany, just like to like civilians, <laughs> like just selling parts out here, just like selling, selling guns out of San Francisco, like from Uncle Charles. It's like, I was like, what? He's like, yeah, he got discharged because he was selling yeah. weapons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry to any of my cousins listening, y'all. <laughs> Uh, he's I mean, passed away now, like, so I mean, statute's over. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's a situation where there's there's a lot going on here. But both the Panthers and the KKK, not that there's any moral equivalency between the groups, mm -hmm. but they both suspect that a massive civil war is coming. Either it's yeah. going to break out, or the the bombs are going to fall, and yeah. in the wake of the nuclear apocalypse, there's going to be fighting between, yeah. um, you know, like racists and non-racists or yeah. black and white, depending on your your perspective. Yeah. Um, and so there, there's this belief that like we are arming ourselves for a war of survival. Um, and considering there are thousands of heavily armed racist people like Louis Beam who yeah. are specifically talking about wars, waging a war of extermination against America's blacks, like that's not an unreasonable thing to want to arm yourself against. Yeah. Then and now. Yeah, that's the part that like I, I I really wish people could like understand like the tone and ire of the moment that this stuff is not imaginary. Like this is yeah. like, when like elected officials, you know, in certain states or just people like him are just like, no, our plan is to wipe y'all out. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, oh, you're not, yeah. you're not like, <laughs> you're not like ambiguously racist. You're not like kind of Nazi light. You know what I'm saying? It's like, nah, yeah. nah, we trying to wipe y'all out. Yeah. Yeah. And you, it's like, yeah, this is something I come to a lot in the modern day. Where it's like, you can, your opinions on, on gun control, mm -hmm. um, are, there's a lot of different attitudes on that. I will yeah. listen to them. But I can tell you from experience talking to a lot of people in a lot of parts of the world, when someone wants to exterminate you, there's nothing you'd rather have in your hand than Absolutely. a gun. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It's again, like, for, like, the, the invention of, the modern day, I say modern with quotes as a historian of Crip and blood, like the invention of the street gang, specifically growing up in Los Angeles, puts such a different taste in your mouth about guns. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah. you you know, so like it's yeah. hard for me to like, you have my father that's like, no, it's your, what are you talking about? It's your civil right, man. He's people mm -hmm. finna come. You know what I'm saying? They're like, look, look, why are you going to come get you? You know what I'm saying? And then, yeah. and then you got the streets with that's like, if you pull a gun out, then that means that like, yo, I'm not a civilian. Like, so when somebody yeah. stops you and it's like, hey, where you from? You know what I'm saying? If I got a weapon on me, it's like, oh, oh, you signed up for this gang life. You know, but Oof. if you don't have one, it's like, man, look, I'm a square. I'm on my way to basketball practice. I'll, you know, so with yeah. that sort of like juxtaposition, it's sometimes it's hard for myself to get yeah. my brain around it. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, if knowing, it, again, the context that these people are living in, Syria, Mazul, you know what I'm saying? Like, these people who live in these contexts, it's like, nah, this is not an option. And it, like, it, it is also... Yeah. Yeah, it's also like the difference between just individual self-defense and this idea, which there's a lot of, you know, flaws behind a lot of the thinking that occurs in the United States on this this subject. Yeah. So you can say statistically, like, actually, you're more likely to be harmed if you have a gun in the home. Mm -hmm. The difference between that, individual self-defense and collective self-defense. Yeah. Um, which is, yeah. Um, That's good. Too deep a subject to really delve into very yes. <laughs> thoroughly here. <laughs> While we're trying to you delve into the Panthers, yeah. you know what I'm saying? 
But you know what's not too deep a subject to delve into right now? Oh, here we go. What is let products me see. Which and one? some what services? I'm gonna, I'm gonna set it up. I'm gonna do. The, I'm gonna do the best setup. What is that, Robert? All right, all right. <laughs> a product uh, oh. and a service, which which I think we can explain in the context of this episode. Great. Off we go. We're back. All right. Um, so. As we, before we had our little digression about uh, community self-defense, we yeah. were talking about uh, the, the the Black Panthers start their civilian patrols of the police, armed patrols of the police, um, which are very popular um, and very revolutionary. And, of course, uh, the man, as embodied <laughs> by the Republican Party and the governor of the state of California, Ronald <laughs> Reagan, yes. was not in any fucking way about to let a bunch of black men exercise their right <laughs> to bear arms and legally observe the police. Uh, and I shouldn't just say black men, because there were black women involved at this point too um, yeah, that's the last the lost taking heroes part in these, that's the lost heroes yeah. of the black panther party was really the ladies because they locked yeah. up all the yeah. men or killed us yeah so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah like the, the 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 white republicans particularly uh who govern the state although it's not like the white democrats in the state provided any opposition to this um decide that action needs to be taken um and the guy to do this was a shit heel named don mulford <laughs> what'd you call him again <laughs> A shit heel. <laughs> I love it. I gotta tell you guys, this is another digression. I feel like I don't know. Nobody cusses more poetically than black people or uh, old black man. Nobody cusses more poetic than him. But the most creative and innovative things to call someone come out of the mouth of middle aged white men. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know anyone that's just oh, you fucktard. What the hell? <laughs> Who could, like I'm telling you, man, shit stick. Like what? Like ass given. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Touche, man. I see. That's why that. This is why intersectionality is so important. You just mm-hmm. learn the mm-hmm. best way to cuss. Oh, so multiculturalism really improves the use of obscenities. Yes, it's critical. Yes. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, Don, Mulf- Don Mulford. Uh, Mulford was the community assemblyman for Oakland, and in April of 1967, he proposed the Mulford Act, a bill that would strip Californians of their right to carry firearms in public. The Mulford Act was a pure act of legal targeting against the Black Panthers. And I'm going to quote again from that Atlantic article. Quote, Republicans in California eagerly supported increased gun control. Governor Reagan told reporters that afternoon that he saw no reason why on the street today a citizen should be carrying loaded weapons. He called guns a ridiculous way to solve problems that have to be solved among people of goodwill. Interesting that he doesn't... Read that to Republicans now. (laughs) Tell that to a cop. (laughs) Right? Tell me. That's so funny to me. I'm just like, okay... Y'all, yeah. y'all know not even 30 years ago, not even 30 years ago, 34 years ago, you were saying literally the opposite of what you're saying right now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. In a, in a later press conference, Reagan says he, he doesn't know of any sportsman who leaves his home with a gun to go out into the field or to t- hunt or for target shooting who carries that gun loaded. Uh, and he says the Mulford Act should work no hardship upon the honest citizen. Mm. And of course, the NRA completely backs the Mulford Act. No problem with it at all. <laughs> all, all on board this shit. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all appreciate that, man. Appreciate. Just yeah. take a second to appreciate that. Somebody drop some like, some like spa music right now to yeah. appreciate the NRA was for gun control to make sure you can't yeah. carry a loaded weapon. To find yep. spa music. I, I don't know. I just thought like, <laughs> when you go get <laughs> spa music. <laughs> the thing is, you know what I'm talking about. That's the best part. You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Anyway, so sorry. Read uh, more. Huey, Huey's <laughs> furious about this, but he's not surprised. As I, I read that quote from him earlier, he'd yeah. immediately predicted this is going to happen once we start mm-hmm. doing this. Um, but he carries out a protest. Uh, he organizes a group of Panthers armed to the gills to go march on the Capitol building in Sacramento. 24 men and six women showed up, led by Bobby Seal. They walked up mm-hmm. the Capitol steps, guns in hand, and Bobby read a speech. Quote, The American people in general, and the black people in particular, must take careful note of the racist California legislature aimed at keeping black people disarmed and powerless. Black people have begged, prayed, petitioned, demonstrated, and everything else to get the racist power structure of America to right the wrongs which have historically been perpetrated against black people. The time has come for black people to arm themselves against this terror before it is too late. Mm. Uh, After this, Seal and the others went inside the building bearing loaded firearms, the Capitol building, Um, and they were allowed to do this because they were abiding by the law entirely, and the day proceeded peacefully. 
Um, and before we move on, I think it's worth dedicating a little bit of time to how the mainstream media covered all this. Mm-hmm. And the short of it is they were not fans of the Panthers. <laughs> <laughs> um, really? The New York Times' coverage of the event, which I can only read in my old-timey white man voice. Let's go. I'm Negroes protest gun bill. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Visual um, response to that. Anyway, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Um, now, I did find, and some credit to the New York Times, a modern day New York Times article that quotes Jane Rhodes, which is a very like ad- admitting like we fucked up and we're very unfair in our coverage. Mm. Um, and it quotes Jane Rhodes, a professor of African-American studies, as saying, the newspaper was dubious and skeptical of them. It also gave them a tremendous amount of coverage. The media, like most of white America, was deeply frightened by their aggressive and assertive style of protest, and they were offended by it. And that October 2016 Times article I found analyzing this by Giovanni Russinello, uh, it leans into acknowledging how unfair the coverage was. Mm. And he writes about the Times' first articles on the Black Panthers. What the article did not explicitly say, though, it was reported later by others, was that the Panthers had read a statement that afternoon calling upon the American people in general, not just African Americans, to help them in their push for rights. The Times sent its own reporter a few days later to write a profile of Mr. Newton, the party's young co-founder. That article was no more measured than the first. It barely mentioned police brutality, instead lavishing attention on the fact that the Panthers had weapons. Political power comes through the barrel of a gun, Newton was quoted as saying. So... The mm. journalists who cover this ignore police brutality, ignore that, like, there's a self-defense yeah. narrative here. What do you expect us to do when we're being shot? Yeah. That's one of our rights. Our nation's mm. founded on the idea that that human beings can arm themselves in self-defense. Yeah. That's what we're doing. They ignore that and they're like, look at these black men carrying guns. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. um, so... On July 26th, the racist California legislature passed the Mulford Act with the NRA's enthusiastic approval, and Governor Ronald Reagan signed it into law. So the Black Panthers were thwarted, at least in the state of California, from carrying out armed patrols any longer. Mm -hmm. But the organization continued to grow, spreading across the country and drawing in thousands upon thousands of members. And as the group grew, Huey and Bobby and the other leaders expanded the sort of things the Black Panthers did. It was not enough to just advocate armed protests and police patrols. They needed to mobilize their community. And that, they felt, meant helping their community. Yep. In the early years, the Black Panthers developed a concept they called revolutionary intercommunalism, which is something I really think the modern day left needs to get its shit together Oh my God, if you just do it. (laughs) Yes. Um, PBS describes this as the strategy of building community service programs or survival programs, programs meant to develop positive institutions within the community to help individuals meet their needs. The Panthers developed over 60 such community programs. Now, these community survival programs ranged from the People's Free Shoe and Clothing Program to the Free Plumbing and Maintenance Program to the Free Pest Control Program to the Sickle Cell Anemia Research Foundation and the People's Free Ambulance Service. Mm -hmm. While the news breathlessly covered the Panthers' armed marches and their confrontations with police, they ignored most of these other programs. One member later, a guy named Roger Smith, said this. You don't read about the survival programs we're doing for the people, the free children's breakfast program, trying to feed some of these hungry kids before they go off to school in the morning. The educational programs we had going on for these kids, for the older folks as well, you don't read about that. The shoe giveaway, the clothing giveaway, the coat giveaway we had going on back east so these people don't freeze to death during the winter months. The free prison busing program where we bust people from the community out to the prison, the penitentiary, so the people can visit their loved ones who are incarcerated. You don't read about that. You don't read about the free ambulance service that we had going on in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, because black people in Winston-Salem, Carolina were denied basic emergency health care. You don't read about that. You don't read about the free sickle cell anemia testing program where we tested over 500,000, half a million people before the U.S. government ever realized that sickle cell anemia was a threat to the well-being of black people in America. You don't read about that. Why? Because there's no sensationalism there, no dramatic value. It doesn't sell newspapers. It doesn't boost the television ratings. It's just some black people getting organized to help some other black people. Yeah. Yeah. That so that's the Panthers I know, yeah. You know the like which I mentioned at the top of the show. That's what my my father was part of the after school tutoring program. So like I I just know them as people that fed us in the morning. I mean obviously not us because I wasn't around then. But like you fed kids in the morning, helped them with their homework after school, and the attitude even to this day was like you can't look out can't look for a handout from your oppressor like these people ain't yeah. gonna help you you know what i'm saying like why would you take their money why would you take their services 
because they these they 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 are your oppressors. That don't make no sense. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So like <laughs> that was his that was always his attitude. He was like, man, find yeah. it on your own. Like, man, you don't don't look. You can't owe these people nothing. Find it on. Take care of your own. That was always the attitude. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's still it, like, oh, oh sorry. sorry, real quick, but there's there's a few no, still no, no. like like leftover things where just generationally speaking, there's like we still have a generational like like gap. Like you know, when when I started doing music full time, like the the label I was a part of was like one of my best friends, and you know he's, he's a white dude, right? So my dad still had this like I like I like that boy, but you know you 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 got you got watch them white men now, you know? What I'm saying? I was like, okay, pop, okay. <laughs> like, I mean, I get it, but like, I mean, it's we were friends since high school, man. Like, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I think we're good, you know, but mm-hmm. but still, like, he still has a little bit of that. I mean, he's definitely not the same man he was, but he still has that, like, how you know you gotta, you gotta, you gotta watch them, you know what I'm saying? They, they don't, they not gonna really take care of you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not unfair. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Not unreasonable considering, like, yeah, the time and place yeah. and experiences he had, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and, uh, and I, I do think like you have to open the story of the Black Panthers by talking about armed self-defense, the police Absolutely. patrols, the guns, because that is how it, it really started. Absolutely. But I do think even a lot of like people on the left who admire, like particularly white people on the left who admire the Panthers, they focus a lot on that part because mm-hmm. it is again, the mo- and, and not enough on what really is the most revolutionary part of the Panther yeah. program, which is the survival program. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the, the, the. I don't know if the book got into it that, you, or maybe we'll get to it later, but just the actual like provable success rate, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Of like the yeah. provable results, like this actually worked. You know what I mean? I mean, blood testing half a million Come on now. black people yeah. for sickle cell anemia, like yeah. before the government realizes it's a problem for black people. Like yeah. that's huge. Yeah. That's an enormous effort. Yeah. That's like a state level effort. Yeah. That is, it's all community volunteer yeah. driven. It's amazing. Yeah. Now, by some accounts, the most influential of the survival programs was the Free Breakfast for Children program. Mm -hmm. Uh, While students were guaranteed a free lunch as part of their public education, in 1967, the U.S. government spent only $600,000 a year on breakfast for students. Uh, The Black Panthers saw this hole in the social safety net and realized it was harming black children more than any other group in the country. And so they took action to fix this. Now, the communities in which they provided free breakfast for children were not all instantly on board. The Black Panthers were a revolutionary organization famous for confronting police with firearms. People Mm -hmm. like Minister Bridges of the St. Augustine Church in Oakland were initially suspicious when the group asked to start meeting and distributing breakfast there. But gradually, the Panthers won them over, and the community rallied to provide them with donations of grits, eggs, toast, and milk to feed hungry school children. Much of the food was donated by local businesses from a mix of altruism and fear of social reprisals by the Black Panthers. And I'm going <laughs> to quote from Black Against Empire again. At times, the Panthers' cajoling uh, blended into harassment and strong-arming. Far more common were boycotts and pickets of businesses that refused to assist the programs. Equally common was the tactic of calling out or publicly shaming those who refused to help. Churches and other community-based organizations that refused to help, notably those who refused to sponsor or allow breakfast programs on their premises, faced similar treatment. For starters, the Panther newsletter and Panther representative railed against the non-supportive business person or community leader as a capitalist pig. Other epithets included religious hypocrites, lying preachers and merchants, an avaricious businessman. Dang, cancel yeah. culture, dog. Since, <laughs> yeah. since the 60s, we've been canceling fools. Terrible. I mean, I, yeah. you know, it's. I think that's perfectly fair. Because um, the ultimate goal here is to get kids food. And yeah. like, you've got you've got plenty of extra food. Like, yeah. why are these kids starving in the morning? Yeah, you and know? then you're probably complaining about them saying kids. Yeah. yeah. You know, running your streets. It's like, well, they're hungry, and you could yeah. fix that. The, yeah. Yeah. Now, the free breakfast program itself was a mix of pure altruism, poor kids needing good food, uh, and also clever propaganda. The program highlighted the fact that the richest nation on earth, then waging a brutal and expensive war in Vietnam, could not provide a simple breakfast for all of its children. The leadership of the Panthers, who suspected, or outright hoped in some cases, that they might one day wind up in an armed revolutionary struggle with the U.S. government, knew there was a tactical benefit in winning hearts and minds this way. One of them noted, while we might not need their direct assistance in waging armed revolution, we were hedging our bets that if we did, they would respond more favorably to a group of people looking out for their children's welfare. Yeah. 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 
Uh, in November 1969, the Black Panthers announced that their program had spread to 23 cities and distributed free breakfast to more than 20,000 children. That number wound up being more like 50,000 in minimum. Yeah. Um, the law took notice. In Baltimore, the police called this program a front for indoctrinating children with Panther propaganda. Sheesh. They responded, as only law enforcement can. <laughs> and I'm going to quote again from Black Against Empire. Police and federal agents regularly harassed and intimidated program participants, supporters, and party workers and sought to scare away donors and organizations that housed the programs, like churches and community centers. Safia A. Bukhari's discovered that participation in one of the Harlem Free Breakfast programs fell off after the police spread a false rumor among black parents that the children were being fed poisoned food. Oh a police God. disinformation campaign in Richmond, California, suggested that the party used Free Breakfast for Children program to spread racism and foment school riots. Student participation began to decline. For forcing local Panther leaders to combat the official disinformation. The police were not above raiding breakfast lo program locations, even while the children were eating. In ba the Baltimore Panther branch was comparatively small, but as Judson L. Jeffries demonstrates, the branch endured an excessive amount of violent repression, and not even children were spared harassment by the police. One morning, the Baltimore police disrupted the children's breakfast, barging menacingly onto the premise. A witness recalled, they walked around with their guns drawn and looked real mean. The children felt terrorized by the police. The police were like gangsters and thugs. Dang. Yeah. You're just getting breakfast, homie. Just trying to feed just kids getting, breakfast. Just trying to get breakfast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, A while. Uh, now, ev yeah, eventually, the state decided that the danger of this propaganda of the deed, uh, as I think Bakunin would have called it, uh, mm -hmm. was so great that the only reasonable response was to start providing American children with free breakfasts. By 1972, the U.S. government free breakfast program had reached more than 1.18 million children. The massive upswing in funding for this program proceeded directly from Panther activism. So Norma dope. Matume, a former Panther, said this in an interview with Eater.com. I really do believe that the government expanded their program because of the work we were doing. I don't think the government wanted to be outdone by a community-based organization, especially the Panthers. I really think we were very instrumental in school food programming. Yo, I'm positive. Yeah. I'm yeah. positive that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, man. What do we, it's like, hey, uh, hey, guys. Are these, are these, are these poor three-fifths of a human's people out-humanizing us? Like, what do we... <laughs> Yeah. What do we do with what are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's remarkable the amount of fear that was generated by yeah. the Panther Breakfast Program. And in some cases, it was more than the fear they had as a result of the armed confrontations by the Panthers. Yeah, um, yeah. You and there's sizable evidence of this. Putting ideas in their brains. Are you getting exactly. ideas in the old skull? No. They start thinking they don't need the government at all. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We shouldn't have never gave them no money. Mm -hmm. Sorry. On May 27th, 1969, J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI and gigantic piece of shit, Kendrick. wrote this in a memo. One of our primary aims in counterintelligence as it concerns the Black Panther Party is to keep this group isolated from the moderate black and white community which may support it. This is most emphatically pointed out in their Breakfast for Children program, where they are actively soliciting and receiving support from uninformed whites and moderate blacks. So, yeah. It's um, crazy how, like, they as immediately assume they're uninformed. Yeah, uh, it's like, oh, you must not know. It's like, no, no, I know, I know what they're doing. That's yeah, I know what they're doing. They're feeding our kids. I can read. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. feeding the kids. It's just, it's just, yeah, feeding the kids. Well, you know, they're socialist. Well, if socialist mean my, means if socialism means my kid doesn't starve. Maybe yeah. I like socialism. Yeah. <laughs> here's the thing. Here's the thing. I can't pay for breakfast, and y'all not helping me get it. Yeah. So you call them whatever they want. You call yeah. them whatever you want. <laughs> I'm gonna come get some breakfast for my children. Yeah, but you know, it it, it says a lot mm -hmm. um, about the state of the government, about yeah. the nature of capitalism, about the nature of law enforcement. That the free breakfast program was one of the things that scared the FBI director the most. Yeah. Um. And in part two, we're going to talk about J. Edgar Hoover's plan uh, and the nationwide mm. law enforcement campaign to take down the Black Panthers. Mm. I can't um, wait for you guys to learn this stuff. Yeah, so this is a behind the behind the bastards episode. We're yes. not talking mostly about bastards in this one, mm -hmm. but you need the setup to really yes. understand how shitty the bastards are. Yeah, love it. So prop. This yes, has been the end of part one. Um, you want to drop a couple of plugs at the end, and we will sail out uh, until Thursday. Oh my god. Yeah. So website is prop hip hop, uh, which is also all of my sort of social media handles. Prop hip hop. Um, that's for tour dates, for my own podcast, again, called Hood Politics. 
believe politics is just gang banging in nice suits. So we just kind of like <laughs> explain your headlines just in gang terms to help you understand what's going on. Um, and uh, yeah, and yeah, just hit me on the website and, and the social meets, Prop Hip Hop. Yep. And I'm sure folks who are listening who are really knowledgeable of the Panthers will notice there's some it, crucial stuff we left out from this period. Uh, we, we haven't talked about yeah. um, some important figures. We haven't talked about like the 10 point program. We're going to mm. get to a lot of that in part two. Rad. It's kind of impossible to like do this all chronologically. I just kind of had to set it up the way it made yeah. sense as I was writing. I was, writing I was yeah. prepared to, before you even asked to be on the show, I was prepared to have like mercy for you because it's such a big thing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, I'm pretty sure there's other episodes where there were other people that were like grossly well familiar with like whatever you was going to talk about yeah. that I just didn't know nothing about. You know what I'm saying? So like in the, like in the, like the R. Kelly episode, I was like, you didn't grow up on 90s R&B. You're not going to know some of these nope. deep cut things that I know. Nope. I'm like, man, cut the guy some <laughs> slack. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, so I was prepared to give you. So I'm telling all the listeners too, man, cut the homie yeah. some slack, dog. Like, you know what I'm saying? Can't cover everything. Yeah, and we'll we'll get to I, I think a lot of it uh, uh, in part two. Um, yeah. you know, as much as is possible in eleven thousand words and two hours and change. Yes, sir. But uh, that's going to be on Thursday. Uh, you can find all the sources for this uh, on behindthebastards.com. You can find me on Twitter at I Write Okay. You can find this podcast on Twitter and the gram at, at Bastards Pod. And you can buy shirts on T Public. And that's that's the damn episode. Um, we'll be back with part two. Skadoosh. Oh, I have another podcast uh, that exists on the internet called Worst Year Ever. And if you want to learn about another community of people who have been ignored by law mm. enforcement and the media uh, reacting to violence and using community self-defense to protect themselves, we just did a two-part episode um, on a, a chlorine gas attack on a I furry convention and everything that resulted from that. So yeah, check I was that listening out. to it on the way. That's really good. It's really good. Yeah. Okay. That's really your good. plug. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's it's really good. Is my plug? Yeah, this is really That's good. That's a double plug, triple, triple plug. plug. It's so good. Right. Now the episode's actually over. <laughs>